like when someone farts in a room full of like 50 people, if everybody inhaled, it would go away quicker. Welcome to the Dylan and Joe Basement Podcast. We're your hosts, Prohibition Dylan and Modern Day Drinker Joe. <laughs> Modern Day Drinker Joe. And uh, welcome aboard. And today we're going to be uh, getting started talking to you guys about the uh, some facts and history about alcohol in general. And then we're going to top off that with a uh, with a little piece of competition eating. Yeah, I mean, after the the year ended up, we're talking about the apocalypse and the end of the world. It's uh, time to celebrate. It's a new year, and a new year means just time to stuff yourself full of whatever fun and cheer you can get. So we're on a happier mood. I figured we talk about the history of alcohol and how that's been part of uh, cultures all around the world, and then the more modern art of competitive eating, which is another way to stuff your face. So a little more indulgent this week. <laughs> that's right, Joe. And uh, it, all, both of these things really, you know help everybody through the end of the world and as mentioned we just went through that and you're definitely going to be eating and you're absolutely going to be drinking as oh, alcohol yeah. has been a big part of uh human civilization uh since really since uh you know how many years ago joe were uh, homo sapiens really kind of mixing with neanderthals what was that maybe even before yeah, m modern humans we, we tend to think it's around forty thousand years ago so anytime then <clears throat> and before that you know yeah yeah, and uh, just according to science, I mean, the first thing with with like you know who was drinking what, when, where, and why, um, that the dawn of uh, the birth of, of of humans to begin with, we we had enzymes to process alcohol even way past forty thousand years ago. We're talking way before that, um, but uh, they kind of evolved into a, a enzyme to process ethanol because that's what we're drinking. It's really just the breakdown of of grains and sugars into ethanol. Um, mm -hmm. So that's really the first thing. And, and the first funny story about that is um, animals, uh, some of them have a tendency to get drunk. And the first animal I think of, Joe, is an elephant. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention is that it's not just a purely human aspect to be able to be using alcohol. I mean, anytime that fruits and food would go out and spoil, they'd start to ferment and any animal can come on up there and start eating. It's not out of the question that probably for hundreds of thousands of years, early primates were, you know, ingesting rotten fruit to get drunk i mean it still happens today yeah yeah it still does i mean they see uh i don't you know it's it's really funny because the story i'm thinking of is elephants eating apples but i i i don't know about you i haven't seen an elephant in an apple orchard yet but um me neither they must have been delivered <laughs> <laughs> exactly so so let's just picture an elephant in an apple orchard story about an elephant is it a true story yeah I know, I know it's a true story that they eat. They they are definitely one of the the <clears throat> part of the group that does like to get drunk from time to time. Whether they're I eating know. apples or not, I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's any, it's any like a, fruit. yeah, any rotten fruit that has that that somehow there's has access to yeast, which is typically everywhere. Um, yeah. Well, rotten. If I was I was mentioning as you're walking through an apple orchard, you sometimes you get that really rotten apple smell that as a uh, uh, seasoned uh, uh, beverage consumer, it tends to smell very good. And I'm be yeah. curious as to how the natural buzz of a apple on grass that ferments makes you feel, but it's, I mean, it's there. What's the worst thing that can happen? You're going to puke and shit your brains out, but it might be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely um, possible. And, and yeah, so, so, so moving on to um, <clears throat> when, when humans really started to get uh, that we have record of, um, mm -hmm consuming alcoholic beverages and the and the first one that comes to mind is in a uh, sweet little beautiful town in israel we're in israel and um and they found so interesting i want to see check, check this out because i know it's different than the egyptians but they were stone pots right joe not clay yeah yeah i think it, it looks like uh, almost like how you have a mortar and pestle like that kind of like ah. i think that kind of material like you know how it's it's harder than uh, clay because you have to be mashing stuff into it. So it needs to be like mm. a 
solid structure. Mm-hmm. I think it was that kind of uh, like, yeah, like you said stone. Yeah. 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 And, and from what I read, they, they would still had liquid in it. So it was, it, and it was beer. They found beer. So yeah, these they, people, it all. yeah. So these middle Easterners were, were drinking beer back then. I mm-hmm. think that's awesome. So that's really like the, the, really the, what we have so far today, I'm sure, you know, there's so much about history that we don't know. So there could be, right. could be plenty of other situations going on like that. Um, but next up, um, Joe, do you have anything before we talk about Egypt? Uh, yeah, I mean, so, it, I mean, it's around the same time period where they think that, you know, it started being a wide practice to be fermenting and making beer and things like that, which we think beer is the oldest that they're making deliberately brewing it, not just finding rotten fruit, things like that. Uh, 7,000 years ago um, in China, called in a village called Jiahu in northern China, well, they didn't find it 7,000 years ago. This is when it was dated to. <laughs> but it was uh, um, jars, much like the ones that are in uh, the Middle East. I don't believe these were stone jars, though. And they had a residue of liquid that had grapes, hawthorn berries, honey, and rice. So it seems like kind of an early uh, wine uh, production there. So just mm. two different parts of the world, but they were both producing their own uh, drinks that we can find out happened that long ago. Wow. Yeah, that's an interesting one. So you said you said grapes, rice, honey and um, hawthorn uh, berries yeah that's weird so um so what we know about uh you know alcohols like brandy rum sake absinthe whiskey so on and so forth they each mm-hmm. have a core a core um like let's just say grain for now um yeah, for, most of our fruit grain, yeah it's that uh it's that f- for lack of a better term, it's the food for the yeast to be munching down. Yes. On, you know? Yeah, exactly. And it can be grapes. It can be barley. It can be sugar cane. It can be rice, Potato. whatever it is. You mentioned a specific beverage that has like three different types of like yeah. something for the alcohol to munch on. I wonder what's up with that. Cause like usually from, for these days, I mean, what, what people are, it's at the liquor store is like a, a primary thing like it's like it's either grapes or it's yeah you pick one and that's or it's yeah yeah exactly but you just mentioned one that had like a few of them so i wonder what that would be like uh yeah i wonder if that was deliberately how they how they knew how to make it maybe like saying like well we don't we can't get it to work unless you try all these together and they Mm. got it to work with all four and they kept just using all four to make it work every time like the the ratios were off or something Mm. i mean honey and grapes uh, putting honey and berries rather seems to be like trying to add to the sweetness of the mm. flavor rather than just having straight rice, which would taste probably more like barley wine or something like that. Um, yeah, that's my closest guess, but they don't have, uh, as far as I looked into, they don't have any evidence of why they use so many different types in it. It's just what they found in the uh, in the residue. So cool, oh, that's awesome. Um, <clears throat> so they found that in the residue. That's great. So around the so same time as all this. Yeah, I was going to say, I think Egypt uh, comes into the picture at the same time. It's just on the end of a different part of the world. Yeah, exactly. And my my theory is, I mean, they've they've been probably making beer just as long as Israel has. I mean, there's, yeah, they had, they had batteries that we found because, I, yeah, I think that they all probably were going far enough, farther to back than we realized. I mean, before they made that discovery in Hafia, I'm sure that they thought it was, you know, probably 6,000 years ago. They found out that it was later than that. But like you're saying, for the most part, we have imagined this has been happening for much longer than we have discovered, just because the all the other evidence points to it. Yeah, exactly. And you've got you've got super super uh, powerful, you know, um, pharaohs and, and royalty in in Egypt, and they had access to all this all these type of things. Like I said, their technology level was. There's a lot going on in Egypt that we're not going to talk about right now, but you know, at the very least, they had batteries and pots. They made them in clay pots with it's some sort of alkaline solution and lead and whatever it is they're drinking beer just that's just happening um and a thousand years ago they found evidence of a similar residue with the uh, wheat and barley in eastern europe mm-hmm. so even that i mean it wasn't even a large civilization there back then but they were still brewing it up you got to do something to pass the time back then you're either whether and the, and the cool thing is it's almost like it's an ultimate equalizer um you didn't have to be rich to, to get drunk um so the egyptians it was oh, it yeah, yeah, exactly. So you didn't have, yeah, some some things obviously like, uh, you know, s- certain foods and environments, especially in Egypt, were only reserved for the pharaohs or for royalty or uh, people like that. Um, but alcohol seems to be something that everyone's enjoying. If they're brewing 300 gallons a day at just one brewery in Egypt, 300 gallons, that's a lot of beer. 
that's a lot of beer today. I mean, never mind that that long ago. That's like a massive production. That's a yeah, that's a lot of beer. Yeah, three hundred gallons. And the thing is, to do it three hundred gal- gallons a day, that you can actually kind of produce. That's a that's a lot. <laughs> that's a, a real substantial, fully operating brewery. It's pretty cool. Oh yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Of course, they weren't canning it back then, but that would be a lot of thirty racks, I'd imagine. Yeah, they were clay potting it, maybe. Clay potting it. <laughs> Everyone's yeah, just doing it. this. <laughs> I also read that in uh, Mesopotamia and in Egypt, in the early stages of brewing, they would drink it through it with a reed. They find the river or like a straw so that they wouldn't get all the residue of the barley in the, because it wasn't filtered like oh, we have today. Yeah. But you'd, ha- you'd finish your beer and the whole bottle would be filled with like a sediment of all the other uh, smaller. Yeah. Yeah, in there. yeah. So they decided to drink it through a straw so you wouldn't get all the chunks in your mouth when you were drinking. Plus you get oh, yeah, drunk. That's fun. Yeah, so that um that part of the the there's like the mash and then the wort. I forget which what, what is what, but yeah, at the end of the process of any any beer you're drinking today is always at least filtered through like cheesecloth or um, yeah. through a siphon, a siphon and cheesecloth, and you leave all that residue of yeast and uh, other th- thicker particles at the bottom. Exactly. Yeah, I mean now yeah. today it's kind of more in vogue. They started selling uh, unfiltered beer, so you get that cloudy look to it. Yeah, you, know, you can't look at the glass. But even unfiltered beer they produce now is still filtered. It's just filtered. Definitely. Less. Yeah, filtered less. Like a Bud Light would probably be the ultimate example of the most processed beer. Yeah, they put your body out of it. It's just the, it's just the water. So yeah, that's yeah. severe. Yeah, yeah, that's severe processing. Whereas like a probably some sort of West Coast IPA, New England IPA actually unfiltered. Oh, New England um, IPA is unfiltered. You commonly yeah, know. it is probably filtered to the level that like I would filter when back when I brewed some couple batches, siphon mm-hmm. and cheesecloth. That's pretty much. Yeah. Much it. It's gonna be cloudy. Yeah, it's it's great and it works and ain't nothing wrong with that. Lots of new balls, you know. <laughs> uh, tell me, Joe, is uh, what's that saying? Uh, beer before beer before liquor, never been sicker. Liquor before beer, you're in the clear. I think you're in the so. clear. Yeah, is there any truth to that? I don't believe so. That's actually interesting. We can debunk that myth right now. There's all different kinds of ways people feel when they drink different types of alcohol. I think it's mostly about the rate of which you're getting drunk because ultimately you're still metabolizing the same compound. Wine doesn't have different kind of ethanol than, you know, vodka or beer. It's the same chemical you're getting in your body. It's just, you know, made a different way and it's different ratios. So all I can find through, through modern science is that they're all anecdotal things. Oh, I drink wine, I get silly. Oh, I don't, don't have tequila, you know, one tequila floor. I'm going to hit the floor if I have tequila. Or, oh, I, I can't drink beer after drinking a shot because I get sick. It, it, I, I believe everyone's story. Everyone's different. Everyone's body works differently. But ultimately, the only thing that's actually provable is how much alcohol is going in your system and how well your liver and uh, body can metabolize that alcohol. That dictates how much you get fucked up. So I think often if you're drinking beer before liquor, it's more of a story of how you started drinking heavily as more as the night went on. You're drinking beer and now you're drinking liquor later on rather than liquor before beer. You're probably doing a smaller circumstance. Oh, let's have one martini and then we'll chill out later. I think that's more often the case. It's not the actual things you're drinking. It's the kind of evening you're having and how much you're consuming at what speed, I think is what happens. Hmm. And so that's what science is saying. How do you, right. do you have any experience with like, like tonight's a wine night, tonight's a tequila night, tonight's uh the weekend I'm going to have, I'm going to do, I'm going to stick to just beer. Cause I know that it makes me, I don't feel as bad in the morning. Um, is there any sort of like non-truth about like just a pretty much an opinion about like that type of thing that you have? Yeah, for me, I find that if I just um, drink only beer alone, I can usually keep it up a pretty decent pace my tolerance is pretty high so i probably won't feel that bad the next day i won't really feel sick that night but when you start throwing in hard liquor it's forget about it even if it's <laughs> if i'm drinking just a whiskey or if i'm drinking a, you know a shot of you know tequila and then drinking a beer it's that's when it's like yeah I'm, it's your all bets are off same with wine if i just have it by itself it's not a big deal you, you add in the hard alcohol in there that's when it starts to really mess with me yeah yeah Yep. How about you? I, I, I just, yeah, I know the science is there. Your, your, your liver doesn't care what it is. It breaks it down exactly the same. Right. Um, 
but I mean, I, I, I typically feel like I can have a different buzz no matter what, depending on what I'm drinking. I, science I don't, can't I, really I, prove I do, it. I do feel differently too. Like I would feel yeah. differently if I'm drinking beer or wine, but even though the science isn't there, but I, I do feel that way. I think a lot of people do. Well, let's do this. Like, I mean, do you feel different if you have, um, all right, we're taking other drugs out of the situation. Grapefruit <laughs> juice versus orange soda. No, that's a fucking horrible example. Um, so <laughs> I mean, I do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do. Yes. One, one of them, I'm confused on how bitter it is and why I'm drinking it. And the other one, I'm like, hell yeah, let's fucking party. Yeah, let's fucking have some orange soda, guys. Um, yeah, okay. So, yeah, but, I mean, for me, again, I know the science is there, but like, I, I, genu- I definitely feel different. I mean, like, yep. depending on what I'm having. I mean, I, for some reason, feel like I process scotch so much better than anything else. When I have wine, I always get headaches the next day. Where I mean, I, I get hungover all the time, but like, I get, uh, if it's scotch, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't get them as much. I just, uh, and, and it could be because it's, a, I'm slowly drinking it. I don't know. I don't know. But I feel I warmer and nice and it's, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure, but I think that that's a lot of what it is. It's a lot of, a lot of it's anecdotal evidence because it's something that most people who are adults have tried at some point. So everyone has their own experience on how it happens. But you got to imagine if you're, at, you know, if you're sipping a, a nice scotch with a couple of rocks in there and you're, you're hanging out for a couple hours, you're drinking at a much different uh, pace even and less altogether. If you're doing like, you mm. know, E shots at a bar. I don't care if you're drinking the same thing, you're getting fucked up. Like I you're gonna mm-hmm. feel differently than those two situations still, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's true. No, I hear you on that. Um so but yeah, that's just a tough one. Opinion opinion wise, totally feel different depending on what alcohol I'm drinking. I mean, yeah. it's just and, and tequila is probably the most universal version. People get wild on tequila, and I don't yeah. I get wild on everything, but a special wild on tequila. It's like this, I don't drink tequila during the week. It's just not something I'm going to do. I've tried yeah. it. And I'm like, it's just like, I can't sleep well. It's like a weird, I don't know. It makes no sense because it comes from, it's what, agave base? Yeah. Yeah. Agave, so, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I've never, I don't think I've, I've had agave syrup, but whatever. Um, yeah. So that's that. where there's, we don't really, we definitely don't have a conclusion to that besides our our souls and our hearts tell us that it's different. Um, <laughs> exactly, your liver <laughs> is the same, but your your soul knows the difference. In my mind, no, in my mind. In your mind. Well, maybe I have the answer. It could be this, Joe. Um, so we can call liquor a couple different things, and one of them is commonly referred to as spirits. Spirits, for sure. And we're talking about the history of this stuff. And it's called spirits because uh, the first, our first boy in, in the house today, Aristotle. Um, Aristotle from ancient Greece. Yep, Aristotle from ancient Greece. Aristotle, um, uh, he actually believed that um, the, some of the first uses of alcohol were due to people who were dying or depressed. So they would drink alcohol to get through that, get, get those bad spirits out of them. Oh, See where I'm man. going with this? Um, yeah. yeah, and Aristotle, um, that was what he believed. He believed that you're putting good spirits into your body and the spirits of the the, veg, the, the things that you're fermenting or leaving, and it's all a big spiritual thing. Um, wow. In a way, so, he's not wrong. It's just uh, my spirits it's definitely good. change when I have alcohol. That's a fact. So maybe the unseen to the naked eye science of alcohol really does go back to the spirits and tequila has got some wild spirit situation going on here. Whereas for example, like a digestif isn't really a crazy party drink. So, um, what's that? A digestif. Oh, great question, Joe. A digestif would be, <clears throat> uh, about just about every country has their own. Um, I was going to say the United States is the most famous for Jägermeister. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which means hunter master, <laughs> not in English. <laughs> not English. Most commonly found at dive bars, though, from a machine. Um, yeah, which is upside <laughs> down and chilled. I don't. Do they still have those? Because those were big for a while, dude. I think. I know that the uh, the the dirty Finn had it for a while. Definitely had that machine. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fins. Oh yeah. Um, that yeah, that had the Jägermeister machine. Um, and besides Jägermeister, I'm not sure America really has any. United States of America has 
their own version. But I know, for example, Greece has something called Uzo. Um, and then so like some of the other... Kind of? What? It's like a liqueur what? thing? Yeah. Yeah, it's like a liqueur that, um, that encourages the right type of stomach acid. Um, so people outside of the U.S. who aren't don't have a binge drinking problem use drink all the time. They have a, they they I'll can have <laughs> they can have a glass of wine with lunch and not take it to the next level. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Huh? What are you talking about? America is a drinking problem. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? What do you mean a drinking problem? Raise your raise your stein. Well, it's okay. I'm German today, and well, and American. I'm a German American. <laughs> You're an immigrant, in other words. I'm an immigrant with my horse stein. <laughs> Thousands of years <clears throat> after the beginning of brewing, and people are thinking that uh, you're drinking it, and the good spirits go in, the bad ones go out, and they're in Greece. Mm-hmm. Yep, and uh, Persia. You're somewhere in Persia, and it's time to cut off your leg. It happens. Um, <laughs> happens. And, that, and they they're like, all right, we're gonna give you um, this uh, beer. And uh, it's going to help with the pain. And it was used for that, for depression and for giving to dying people to uh, help their spirits. Um, so that, that, that covers that. I can't think of anything else besides alcohol. Besides, we're almost there. Um, it's uh, being used as something specifically, which we all know of because there's a lot of myths around it, um, mm-hmm. instead of water. Joe, why would you drink beer instead of water? Well, first of all, it tastes good and it makes you feel good. That's step one. And water makes you feel good. doesn't taste very good. It doesn't taste like anything, but it can make you feel great. And the other thing is that uh, <clears throat> water is not an antiseptic. It has no alcohol in it. So it's very easy to be uh, polluted with all kinds of bacteria and pathogens, especially if it's not moving water. So one reason you might want to have beer instead of water is to make sure you don't get sick from drinking it and you can still be hydrated from it just not to that same degree. I, I believe you're probably referring to uh, the uh, colonization period when they were gonna have to start a whole new country and they didn't have enough uh, nice clean water with them. Weirdly enough, I am. <clears throat> um, to, the, to the folks who are listening today, um, and for you, Joe, um, the Mayflower specifically had more beer than water on it. Specifically wow. because it was at the time of people who experienced some diarrhea, also known as dysentery, for those of you who played Oregon Trail. Um, yeah. Shit yourself to death. Dehydrated. Shit yourself to death. Uh, loose skin, whatever the fuck that means. Rapid heartbeat, some weight loss, a bunch of shit, also known as cholera. Um, and yeah, cholera strikes again. Cholera strikes again a lot of times in human history. So yeah. at the time, it was like, I could risk getting cholera by drinking the water on the Mayflower, or I'm going to yeah. drink beer um, to stay hydrated, Probably. which is funny because it's a diuretic and I've, I, I'd, I'd be dead. I mean, I, I, I definitely know I'd be dead yeah. um, if all I had to drink was beer. It sounds fun if you're fucking 19 and you think that's hilarious, but it's actually yeah. not. Well, it's 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 only fun. Yeah, it's only fun the one night you start doing it. Then when you <laughs> day one is fun. Beer for breakfast, you're like, fuck me. It's, it's old real quick, I'd imagine. We've all been there. You go to, especially you have a mimosa We've or Bloody Mary for breakfast. Food. It's so much fun for one hour. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, then you're, and then it's like, it's 9 45 a.m. and you step outside and the sun's beating down in the summer and you're like, I'm already hungover and I wasn't before I went to breakfast. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. It's like, uh, it's like when you have a, a, a Uno hand and you have like 20 cards in your hand and then you pull one card and you finally get the one you want and you put it down but you're still holding a handful of cards. Like, even if you just find mm-hmm. the one card you need, it's not over. You're going to have to pay the piper at some point. And alcohol always makes you pay for it, no matter what. You've yeah, it. unfortunately, it's just the, it's the, uh, the fine um, uh, balance uh, of human life. It's never that good. That, that's the nature of the beast. <laughs> you can't just take a drug like alcohol and be like rocking it and then you phase off and just feel great forever i mean can you imagine if alcohol wasn't detrimental to your health and didn't give you hangovers it's We'd already the most popular drug in the world it would be out of control 20 people a day and well i don't know before covid it could have gone up or down who knows 20 people a day die excuse me die of alcohol some sort of alcohol 
alcohol poisoning alone, not even including cirrhosis and other liver diseases. Mm -hmm. um, not including so, drunk driving accidents. Not including yeah, yeah, literally just and <clears throat> neglect that's fueled by alcohol and all that. Yeah, so just just simply just alcohol poisoning. Twenty people a day die, which is not hard to do, but it's kind of hard to do. You got to really not. Know I, what you're doing. Honestly, alcohol is you know an, an awful thing objectively on the, the health of the world. I mean, if you're talking about just people's you know biology and the loss of human life it's clearly a, a huge issue but i think that just speaks more to the popularity of it because we've been talking about how it's been going on since before recorded history and it's still going on now but we have all the evidence it's clear that it's not a great thing for the world but makes a lot of money and it makes a lot of people feel good so <clears throat> yeah people have spoken we <clears throat> want to keep it Yep, exactly. So, so for me, uh, until uh, another big event in history, I mean, for almost two thousand years, the 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 history of alcohol moved to you know it kind of got tied into rel religion with like Trappist monks and stuff like that. And but it wasn't yeah. really that exciting. It kind of just was a part of people's lives, and they just cheers and drank a lot of alcohol and for two thousand yep. years, and then it got banned, right? Yeah, my the story I came to here today to tell is a little bit before that because this the, my yeah, story yeah. takes in uh in the United Kingdom, but it's actually in Ireland at the, at the time, which was Northern Ireland was still part of the United Kingdom, not then. So before America decided we're putting the kibosh on this whole booze thing, uh, which would never fly in Ireland for the very reason I'm about to talk about right now. <laughs> so as they- It would never flow fall, in Ireland? It would never flow, <laughs> it would never flow, but it would, but it would flow. So. Ireland is famous for a particular type of alcohol. Like we said, that, you know, each region has their own versions of it. Uh, Ireland started making whiskey after it was popularized in Scotland. So even though we think that distillation has been going on around 4,000 years, so not as much time as brewing and uh, making wine, because distillation is concentrating alcohol more and more. So that's how you get something like a, a, a scotch instead of a beer, because you're trying to concentrate that alcohol. Um, even though it's a different process. So around 4,000 years ago, the process was starting and it was probably in uh, the Middle East and Northern Turkey, they started doing it for the first time. Uh, Ottoman Empire kind of shit coming up on it. Um, and it was adopted in Scotland in the 1400s. Then within that 100 years, it was adopted in Ireland. Now you're getting Irish whiskey, you're getting scotch and all the, the famous kinds of that. So we're gonna fast forward all the way to the uh, 1800s for the story of the great whiskey flood of Dublin. Before you start, I just want to point out that whiskey is spelled two different ways depending on where it's from. Mm -hmm. Whiskey, W-I-S-K-E-Y, is everywhere but Scotland. And W-I-S-K-Y is just Scotland, aka Scotch. Yeah. Fun fact. That yeah. That, that's also interesting that it, um, when you talk about scotch, you're talking about scotch whiskey. It's all whiskey, bourbon, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all things like that. They're all whiskey, but you just call them by the name of, you know, where they're from, you know, how mm -hmm. they're made. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So in the, in the 1800s, uh, in the mid 1800s at this time, Ireland is struggling. Um, but they still have their, their distilleries. The oldest distillery that's um, licensed and still working in the world is the old Bushmills Distillery in Northern Ireland. It was founded in 1608 and it's still running today. That's a long time of making whiskey and still selling it. Uh, and those different distilleries were some of the only business that was still going at the time. You know, we got famine happening, the economy is crashing and people are traveling to England, to America, to Canada. They're fleeing Ireland to try to get work and be able to feed their families. Uh, but one of the only industries that's just going strong is the whiskey industry. I mean, it's going so strong. They're they're hiring people to be building barrels, to store it. All the jobs around that market are keeping Ireland alive. Dublin alone at this time had 37 whiskey distilleries in the city limits. So, I mean, that's just one type of alcohol that 37 different places are, are making. And then not only staying open, they're propping up the economy of Dublin at that time. People were need, needed whiskey to be selling all over the British Empire to keep the city running. And when you put all your eggs in one basket, sometimes that basket falls and you break all the eggs. And that seemed to happen in Dublin. It was basically waiting to go off. So 
you fast forward to 1875 is where the flood story happens. They had these warehouses with just barrels and barrels of whiskey all over the city because whiskey needs to be aged and they're leaving it in there to add to the flavor and the, uh, the quality of it. And one of those distilleries uh, that was next to the, uh, the barrels there, the, the out front of, one of the uh, warehouses holding the barrels, a fire starts and there's all kinds of sawdust and wood in there for building the barrels and maintain the uh, whole warehouse, catches fire and the fire spreads like wildfire because now we're in a wooden structure with wood on the ground, a fire and 5,000 barrels. So you know how big a regular barrel is full of whiskey. Whiskey, alcohol, alcohol is flammable. So the barrels start to catch the wood outside of them. The whiskey starts, the whiskey fumes start to ignite. And now we have exploding barrels of flaming whiskey popping off in this warehouse, just exploding, dropping the liquid all over the ground. We have flaming whiskey pouring all over this warehouse. And before people even realize what's going on, the whole warehouse is up and whiskey is pouring out of the warehouse into the streets, like lava flowing out of a building. That's so amazing. I, yeah. I bet that smelled pretty good. Yeah, I mean, it probably did smell pretty good. Out of all the 37 distilleries in the city, 32 <clears> of them were, were in the same section of the city called the Liberties. This is where it happened. So not only now do you have whiskey pouring out into the streets on fire, it's next to all these other wooden buildings that are also full of whiskey. I mean, it's like shooting an ammunition cache. They think it's going to go up. So the whiskey's mm -hmm. flowing out into the streets. It's like fire. They said that this, the squealing pigs running away from the fire was the first time that people actually woke up. It's the middle of the night. No one knew what was going on. And luckily, most people got out of their homes before the flames started to spread, before they saw liquid death rolling down the road. They said that it was about two feet deep in the road of whiskey. So you imagine just this flood full of whiskey coming on the road, two feet deep. If you stood up in it, it would be almost up to your knees, this straight whiskey going through. So obviously the, the fire department, they, they figure, the fire brigade rather, they figure out pretty quickly this is gonna be a big problem. And they show up on the scene. Now what do firemen usually do at a fire? They come down there, get the hoses in and start spraying the thing down and try to contain the flames. Problem is they have a, basically a giant gasoline or grease fire here. If they spray water into the flaming whiskey, they're just going to add a vehicle to spread the alcohol burning more and more. So you can't spray water on it. It'll just splash the fire everywhere. That's not going to help. So they have the bright idea that they're going to contain it. I mean, basically this whole section of the city is lost now. We can't save it. We're going to try to use the gravel and the paving stones to build like a firewall around it which is probably a good idea in a lot of fires at the time if you had mm. to deal with it. I mean, what's the other option? Problem is, it. problem is you can't contain it because it's liquid and it starts seeping through the stones and seeping through the walls. So it just keeps spreading and the fire's getting everywhere. They can't stop it. Meanwhile, the good people of Dublin, the good hardworking folks in Dublin are out of their homes and safe for the most part, but hundreds of people are walking up to the Whiskey River they're taking hats, they're taking steins, cups, bowls, they're scooping whiskey out and drinking it like crazy. I mean, these people are dirt poor and they have a river of whiskey going through the city. Granted, it's on fire. You blow it out, you drink it. There's hundreds of people showing up and drinking this disaster that was happening. It's like, it's like when someone farts in a room full of like 50 people, if everybody inhaled, it would go away quicker. <laughs> That's good. I don't know if they were necessarily trying to help with us that they're trying to cash in on maybe their only chance in life to drink unlimited whiskey. And they did. Yeah, I uh, got to say, if it were me and that happened, it would be like a free pass to not go to work and to just be like, let's have a fucking banger. Of course. I mean, as long as people <laughs> have get fun there. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, most people, a lot of people did that. They found many people passed out on the streets that same night while the fire was still raging because they had yep. drink fill, in other words. Uh, a couple people with their shoes missing because they had used them to scoop up the whiskey and drink a whole shoe fill, which is probably- Shoes a good, a sh yeah, a shoe will work. It, it'll uh, it it'll get the I job mean, done. The opportunity. So, so I just I just love that story for how it is a huge disaster and leave it to <laughs> Ireland to take care of it by going out and trying to drink all the whiskey they can. And uh, so eventually they had to have a different idea on how to contain this fire because the, the conc I mean, the, uh, the pavement stones weren't working. So they get the idea that they could try to make a whole wall out of horse shit. So they did. 
Horseshit and? was a resource they had a ton of in Dublin at the time, and it's still a time before modern uh, cars. So people had horses all over the city. They had plenty of horseshit. They built a whole wall of horseshit around the fire, contained the fire with horseshit. So the Great Whiskey Flood in Dublin was saved by a bunch of drunken Irish people sucking it up and a bunch of smart firemen that decided to pack it with horse shit. I love that story. That's the best story I've heard all week. No question. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's crazy. I mean, that's, that's what alcohol will do. It'll prop up the economy of a place that goes down and people take a sip. Yep. Or, you know, wow. And, and creative too. I love, I love the horse shit part at the end. I mean, it just doesn't, it really yeah. couldn't get better. <laughs> yeah. Great story. Thanks. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. So yeah. uh, do you roll into uh, a little couple of years after that, probably about 30 years after, right? In the early 1900s. Yeah, early 1900s, specifically the 20s, we, uh, the uh, government of the United States of America decided to uh, start the prohibition, put a ban on selling or buying alcohol. The for the kibosh on the whole thing. Kibosh on the whole thing right after the Great Depression, right after World War One. All these times where, oh, he's, uh, you know, like, this is the time we're talking about. It's, it's the, uh, they're trying to solve it. You need the alcohol after the Great Depression and during it, not before it, you know, come on. Yeah, right. So um, yeah, real bummer, um, but, but it's- uh, That's the thing, it went really well and now that's why we still don't have alcohol to this day, right? <laughs> what do you mean? Or did it go poorly and they reversed the decision years later? Yeah, I think uh, the latter, it uh, went uh, poorly and they reversed the decision. Because imagine like right now, they'd be like, all right, we're no longer selling this. People go mental. I mean, they really would. And like, there's, it, it, you know, like, yes, abusing anything is going to have health consequences, consequences. But if you have two drinks a day, I'm not a doctor. I'm not giving advice. I'm not telling you what to do. But two drinks a day is not the worst thing in the world. It's really not. And, and some have heard things of some doctors saying that, up to two for men mm -hmm. a day uh, is 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 a is not a bad thing. The oldest living American who just died like a year or two ago. Oh, sorry, he's the oldest living World War II vet. He was a guy in Texas. Right. Um, he he drank uh, whiskey every single day till he died. Wow. 106. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of factors, as with most studies go. Um, you can almost disprove any study that has ever happened um, that taking this is going to make you live longer or not doing this to make you live longer or less or whatever it is. And yeah, there's I mean, some Lyme things that are pretty awesome. clearly like jumping off bridges, like your chances. Yeah. That's not great. But like, yeah. um, but things like that are kind of hard to disprove. If this guy is only having a glass of whiskey a day and he's living to 106, I'm not here to say that it's not working. No, I mean, there's, there's just so many variables in that, that it would be nearly impossible to decide just with one yeah. person. Oh and yeah. Also, a, li a whole life lived. I mean, it'd be nearly impossible. Obviously if you do things like drink whiskey every day, it sticks out. So people are going to notice it when you're at the end of your life and they go, oh, well, you, mm -hmm. maybe that's the secret. I doubt mm -hmm. that. I doubt that it helped them uh, live longer, but maybe they did. I, I, there's too many variables to, to know that. Well, the thing sure. that I'm kind of pulling together from my own kind of understanding of long of long, what do you call them? Super long lifers? Oh. Oh, Hyper lifers? There's a special name for them. I think they're called old as shit. Long timers, old as shit, uh, ultra they marathoners. <laughs> I don't know. And my grandma's a hundred, hundred point like four. And she, uh, the one thing I can say about her is like, she eats consistently and she doesn't stress about anything. No stress mm -hmm. at all. Never really had to. I mean, she didn't really work a whole lot she worked during the war sort of at the navy yard and whatever it is yeah, so but the same this guy too this this guy it was a mini series on youtube about this guy and and yeah. um he didn't really seem to give a fuck about too many things besides like happiness so yeah he wasn't stressing about uh, things you couldn't control he said he was he was a combat veteran in like you know the the, uh, the asian front in world war ii and yeah, that's like, I had all, all my time. He's like, I had all my fucking shit there. He's like, I sleep with my door open, lives in Galveston, Texas or something. It's like, if wow. someone wants to come in here, bring it on. You know, it just doesn't seem to stress a lot. So, so like you yeah. said, there's a lot of factors into, there's just too many, vari sorry, variables into what this is, but he does definitely, he did drink every single day of his life. Wow. That's wild. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, totally. the prohibition was, a, I think, a, a pretty much a big flop. And then we redid it again on the, in the war on drugs years later. It works just as well as it did. Then. Yeah, we did great. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, but we can thank them for NASCAR because without uh, uh, moonshiners and uh, rum runners and things like that, we can have the tradition of making cars go faster than the cops so you can't get caught selling alcohol. Yep, that's right. That is right. Do you know how the word NASCAR came about? I don't. Uh, during Prohibition, this uh, guy walked up to somebody who had a uh, bored out uh, Ford, uh, post Model T Ford, straight six, straight eight type of car and said, hey, that's a NASCAR. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know we why. We're going to cut I... that one or are we going to leave that? Oh, that stays in. That stays in. <laughs> I, North American Sports Car Association. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So we had, yeah, we'll wrap up alcohol. Um, that's kind of where we're at with alcohol. It's just that the prohibition happened and NASCAR was founded because of that. And people to this day are still tearing down walls in their old homes and finding bottles and cool stuff. And um, and it's uh, it's not inherent. I mean, for me, I think alcohol is not inherently bad if you have self control and if you don't, it can be a problem. But uh, yeah. but. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a thing that this earth creates just another one wonder of uh, <laughs> humanity and civilization and uh and biology study of life alcohol is yes. alcohol thing. like you just said it, it's 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 good in moderation um you can enjoy it as long as you don't have too much of it like many things the same for um food as well mm-hmm However, both are really good, not in moderation as well, if you go to excess. Um, we're yeah. not trying to disprove that either. Both are, <laughs> both are wonderful <laughs> if you go, if Overrated you take both. them way too far. And we all have, and they're great. It's not a problem. Specifically to end the alcohol conversation, the, we don't want to endorse anything, but the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous supposedly, uh, suppose, supposedly, 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 with a D. Yeah. Um, that. supposedly uh on his deathbed asked for a beer that's great that, that's what so, my, my grandmother did she couldn't smoke for the last um couple weeks of her life and then they said this is basically we can't do anything more for you and then she said give me a fucking cigarette <laughs> she didn't yeah. swear but Brand said, know, man yep yeah and at this point you know why not <clears throat> yeah think- yeah i got i got family members who uh same thing it was the last couple of weeks and they're like, yeah, I'm smoking in my house. <laughs> if you're ever going to do it, it, you're going to die. Just fucking go for it. You know? Yeah. Do whatever you want. So, um, so guys, uh, we're, we're going to, the, 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 the future of alcohol is to present day and we're all now, in a pandemic and probably, money. yeah, doing uh, more money now than it ever has, ever has in history. And I bet next year it'll make even more. <clears throat> On liquor alone, twenty billion dollar a year market, not including beer or wine. So, yes. just Americans, just for Americans. Just um, in America. Yeah. yeah, twenty billion bucks for just liquor, not even beer or wine, which probably even, or even more, maybe. Um. So, um. So, anyways, uh, yeah, we're moving on to our next uh, level of consumption, which is which is food, which we all seem to like, right? I eat it almost every day. Damn, me too. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, competitive eating, that's what we're getting into now. So we got went through drinking, now we're in competitive eating. Now, competitive eating is a strictly modern thing. I mean, I'm sure there's always been the classic you and your brother at the dinner table trying to eat mutton faster. Like, it's probably gone on for as long as humans have gone along. But actual eating competitions are definitely a new thing. I mean, within the past couple hundred years is the first time ever we had enough surplus of food that it could ever be feasible to eat it just for the sake of eating it and eating more of it faster. I mean, through all of human history, all the shit we ever talked about, it's like, it's hard to be alive. You're trying to survive the whole time. You're, if you have five cherry pies, you're not going to eat them all in five minutes to try to beat your friend. You're going to save them for when you're starving tomorrow. But that's where we live in now. You have competitive eating and then uh, we have enough food now in a lot of parts of the world to do that. A lot of parts of the world, most parts still don't, which is, you know, why it's ridiculous that we even have eating competitions at all. But that's the modern world. So the, it's pretty the, funny. Just to chime in, sorry to interrupt you. No, the, no, don't feel bad. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. Um, 
eating is essential to life, just like drinking is, just like the sun is, just like breathing is. There's no competitive breathing. There's no competitive sunlight. There's no competitive, yeah. uh, competitive, competitive drinking sunlight. kills people and competitive <laughs> water drinking will also kill you. Um, so this is kind of where we're at. You know, competitive eating is really the only thing we can do that is essential to human life besides exercise, which is, an, which is movement. But um, it's the only thing that's there that is like, feasible weird yeah i mean out of those four I, I imagine i'm pretty bad at all of them but i'd probably be better at competitive drinking than competitive sun getting because i'd probably be dead in three hours uh alexander the great killed 28 people in a competitive drinking contest by the way contest that's awesome 28 people died at a competition by alexander the great in whatever year he was around um for a a drinking alcohol obviously competition 28 people died I'd, I'd wager you that alcohol drinking competitions have been around or are actively around way more than eating because you're in your drinking, you're already indulging. When you're eating, a lot of times you're surviving. You're not always mm -hmm. indulging. That's yeah. why the earliest competitive eating contest on record was eating a dessert. If that's a luxury food item. It's not eating rice or sandwiches. It's eating mm -hmm. an extra thing you don't usually have. First one I could find was in uh, Toronto in 1878. There was a pie eating competition that was uh, for a charity event. So mm -hmm. it was in the papers. So we have a record of it actually occurring. It might have been plenty of ones before them. This is the first one that we have on paper. Um, I don't know who won, but they ate, uh, I think, about uh, 13 to 20 pies, somewhere around that. <laughs> and they, they won it. <laughs> 13 to 20 pies? Yeah, I don't know how, I don't know how many. They, they said it was like around a certain number because a, a year Dude. later, a guy named Joe McCarthy in America ate 31 pies. So they're up in the ante pretty fast <clears> with a competitive pie eating. Do you have any uh, more details? Like, is there a time limit? Like, cause like most current day ones are like eight or something minutes. Yeah, so, I don't have a time limit on them. I don't know if they publish that or not, but yeah, they're all time limit. That's part of the competitive eating. 31 pies. How, how, much you, how much can you eat in a certain amount of time? <clears throat> yeah. 31 pies. I mean, that's. This guy ate 31 pies. Yeah. It's Dude, uh, it's definitely, so like in, in relation to oysters, which we've all had, um, that's the, the next record. Guy. The record. Oh, you have the next guy? Oysters? Next guy. Oysters, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll let you go on that because I was going to say, like, volume wise, I'm comparing oysters to pie in an yeah. eight minute. In eight minutes, I have that that status there, that fact there about like pies versus oysters. Like, pies are obviously yeah. like 31 pies. It was going. Well, then the next guy I got, I couldn't get a time limit on it either. And I imagine it's because there was no time limit and it was just over the course of an evening because these numbers are staggering. And there's no way he did it in under 20 minutes. Um, but his name is Frank Doltzer. This is in 1909 uh, in America. Now, he was a member of the Manhattan Fat Men's Club, which not only existed, but I got a picture of them. And it mm. is as funny as you think it is. It's a social club full of fat guys who do this kind of stuff all the time. And like I mean, in Monty Python. Yeah. And being <laughs> in 1909, I mean, it's easier than in 1809, but it, it ain't as easy as it is getting McDonald's now. I mean, these guys were rotund in a time where you could barely find calories like that. They really put them down. So Frank Doltzer, as part of the Manhattan Fat Man Club, in one night, ate, quoting them, ate 275 oysters. That's quite a bit of oysters. Eight pounds of steak. 12 dinner rolls about this big and three oh. pies but don't worry he washed it down with 11 cups of coffee i mean that's a lot of stuff in it i imagine <laughs> that's just a whole night of how much can you eat whoever eats the most at the end of the night wins but i imagine they either had to roll him out like a large uh, boulder or he just died on the site but uh i don't know that's wow really i had free yeah. oysters one time um, at a at a uh, event where there was unlimited, and I had twenty something, um, which yeah. is it didn't really feel like a whole lot, but like on top of all that stuff, that's that's fucking insane. And uh, the coffee might have helped break it down. I mean, that's like ridiculous. But I wanted to reference that scene in Monty Python. The coffee, the coffee doesn't make it easier on the way out. At least you get all that system flushed out for you. Yeah, and it, and it's acidic, so it it might like break it down a little bit. But like. There's a scene of Monty Python. I forget which one it is, but there's a there's the giant fat guy. He's a uh, food connoisseur, and he mm -hmm. eats all the food. Then he throws up, and then he gets more. He's like a fine food guy, and he's just yeah. Away. It's like how they spit out the wine. <laughs> it just sprays out, and he goes, "Yeah, I'll have more, please." He goes, 
you eat something, he goes, he throws up all his food. <laughs> it's just making fun of that type of culture, which is very and much it, makes me happy. So go on. No, so do you want to go into all, all the other uh, weird competitions and stuff? Because the next thing yeah. I, I was going to get into is the Nathan's famous one, and that's how I'm going to yeah. end it. So yeah, I think we'll end it with Nathan's just because that's the most famous one. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, with Nathan's, um, uh, up until then, um, what I what kind of what I've realized is that uh, it, typically the time limit is eight minutes in modern day uh, food competitions. It's so, like, like the, for example, uh, official time limit, like the MLB or it's like the National Food Eating Association. Yep, or exactly. So, how much food can you eat in eight minutes? Um, and what eight one minutes. of them su surprises me very much, and I feel like I might I might try to. Uh, contest this or, well not contest hey, it. I mean, this is supposed to be an inspirational podcast get out there drink as much as you can eat as many pies as you can go for it's it it's new year's yeah go for it i mean like i've eaten so much food over the past like week it's crazy um so um sonia the black widow oh Tom yeah was, here's a picture of her right here she's yep. amazing you, you're not gonna picture she's one of the best competitive eaters in the world and i bet you before i put picture up you'll have no idea what she looks like it's surprising. yeah no and i haven't even seen her yet um but i know that she ate in 2010 she ate 47 oysters in eight minutes and i feel like i could beat that i fucking oh, love oysters 27 and, is a lot but i bet it was over like 45 to minutes to an hour i'd say one oyster weighs under an ounce by far i mean like maybe a, yeah. an eighth of an ounce eighth of an ounce per oyster especially if you're doing like the the briny like new england oysters or, or like Prince Edward Island, I guess would be a good example of them. I love oysters. Uh, 47, dude? Like, I feel like that should be like at least double that. So I, I feel mean, like maybe this is a good example. Good... Oh, man. I, I don't think you could beat it in eight minutes. I, I'm surprised. I bet you could do more than I would imagine you could, but less than a professional eater because that's what she does for a living. A lot of these people, they have a job and then their side job is like just trying to win these competitions. Just for your sake, because you can't see the picture yet, she looks... Her body type is mine. She's like five foot four. She weighs 120 pounds, maybe 110, whatever. And she can put down that many oysters. Like, damn. Because a lot of yeah, these guys so, on the easy eating competitions, like we said at the Fat Man's Club, a lot of these not that big. guys, they're big guys. But nowadays, you get all different sides of people. They're just, you know, mm -hmm. medium, athletic build, large build. They're all there. Because you don't have to, you know, pack on the pounds. You just got to eat the food in that time limit. If you can handle yeah. it, you win. I feel like, I, I don't know, I feel like that's one that I can take. I mean, like, again, I'm not a big dude either. Um, but 47 yeah. oysters in eight minutes. I mean, I, I can crush oysters. And, they're, and oysters are like a beer. You just slide them in. I mean, they're not, it's like a hot dog where, you know. You to chew it. You can just slide it right well, down. Well, are they chewing them, man? When they do the hot dogs, are they even chewing those? They are barely chewing them. We'll get to that. Okay, we'll get to that. But anyway, so. What I have here for interesting things before, I mean, I, I got a, just a couple of interesting competitions here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, there is the Testicle Festival in Montana, beautiful Montana. Great. Ben, you Very should go. Um, that's a eating competition that's totally crazy. We bull testicles, also known as Rocky Mountain Oysters. Because there aren't oysters no in oysters. Montana. So, <laughs> yeah, um, no, no oysters there, just bulls with balls. Yep, just bulls with balls. Um, uh, and then there's a, uh, there's a kimchi eating contest somewhere in the United States. These are U.S. based ones. Um, yeah. Kimchi. Well, the U.S. Um, obviously is the it's the highest rate of eating competitions in the world. I mean that that's the most American thing. Just stuff in your face full of food. They have eating competitions yeah. in other countries too, but America has the most of them. And if you it's like playing basketball. If you want to go pro, you got to come to the U.S. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So. Um, Big money. <clears throat> Uh, I've got two other weird ones in here with also a prize amount for these type of things. Um, yeah. the, I think the hardest one, quite frankly, um, is a uh, jalapeno eating contest. Um, the record is 265 jalapenos. Um, Jesus, that's a ton. Because now you're adding a level of difficulty on top of it. It's not just the amount of food, it's the spiciness that's unrelenting the whole time. Well, the spiciness, because how what makes pepper spicy if probably most people know is capsaicin same thing in pepper spray it, it's real i mean it's there anybody who's ever cut jalapenos or habaneros and touched their eyes you know yeah. what that's all about um the, the highest concentration of capsaicin in the seeds too so when you when you eat the whole thing it's, it's spicier than just slicing it up and cooking it because the seeds have the most capsaicin in them so great you get point the yeah that's my next point is is that okay. um in each jalapeno, there one one standard jalapeno, whatever the FDA says that is, 
is 223 milligrams of potassium, which is kind of cool. That's like a, a lot. Bananas, wow. yeah, yeah, that's a good, good amount. But the uh, uh, jalapeno is made of the exocarp, the uh, mesocarp, the endocarp, placenta, and the seeds. Um, and I think the definition is you got to eat all that shit. Yeah, the whole thing. 265 of those. Um, so that's a crazy composition, and your stomach. You have that's to feel be a rough off. one, man. Yeah, and yeah, and, and like not to be gross, but like that's gonna really burn, dude. Like you're gonna be hot, hot, hot on the way. Either way, coming out, it's gonna be painful. I mean, any of these even competitions, when you're done, even if you didn't win, you're gonna feel awful for the rest of the day, probably. But particularly the jalapeno one. Shush, whoa, good, good yeah, luck. Yeah, not you. a good time. Um, but even potentially even more painful, just because it's it's pretty much 100% artificial. Not artificial, but you've got sugar mixed with like a what is what are marshmallows made of? Sugar and corn syrup, or yeah. that's it. I think so. I think that's it too. Yeah, um, I think it's just they're only inflated by how much air that you let like it rise before you take it out of the the, uh, the marshmallow the oven machine. <laughs> marshmallow machine. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, I think the price is only about how much you let it expand. It's like a, a cake or whatever. How much later? Right. Ride. Yeah. So whatever, whatever's going on with marshmallows. Um, uh, there's a record of 255 peeps. Peeps. Oh man, I couldn't that, even eat a sleeve of peeps. Never mind. I don't know, man, Joe. Would you rather eat 255 peeps or 265 jalapenos? I think that's a really good question. I would rather eat the peeps just because not they wouldn't be as spicy. Um, but I hate peeps and I think they taste terrible and they are terrible and I like jalapenos, but if I had to go for the whole amount, I'd have to go peeps. Um, but you, I mean, imagine when you eat too much candy, how much your stomach hurts. And then you put, you know, a metric ton of marshmallows in your gut. That's going to take, I mean, that's going to be almost as bad coming out as the jalapenos, even though it's not spicy. It's, you didn't bind it up there. All that marshmallow just sitting in you just, ugh. yeah, I feel like you're like, if you didn't have like your appendix out, you're going to have to have it out. Like. Oh, your your pancreas is gonna tell you to go fuck, and your and your kidneys might have an issue. That insulin. Yeah, like it's it's it. it's the type of thing that like you're you shouldn't be eating two hundred sixty five anything, but like peeps, I feel like are so from Mars that like all right, so yeah. the ingredients the ingredients of peeps are exactly what we thought: sugar, corn syrup, gelatin. That's oh, the we're missing. Gotcha. That's the um, chewiness in there. <clears throat> I think you have to hit hit yourself with insulin like an epipen before you even start the challenge. You're 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 fucking sugar. You're fucked. Yeah, I mean right. like. Um, it's pretty bad. Um, sugar, corn syrup, gelatin, some dyes, some preservatives like potassium sorbate, flavors, and wax and car 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 wax. Nah. Um, but I, I and then sugars per serving is uh, serving size is ten chicks, and there's thirty one grams, which is about half of a, a, a can of Coke. Um, gotcha. So it's a lot of sugar. Yeah, two hundred. Yeah, it's basically like um, uh, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. That's a, so that's a lot of fucking cokes, three, is what I'm saying. Three hundred grams for half of it. So if you double that, it'd be six hundred grams, and then however seventy five on top of that. So that's you know almost a thousand grams of sugar right there. Oh boy. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, not a whole lot of anything else though, which is nice. Um, but. That's pretty fucking crazy. I just feel like I yeah. would never, sh I would never go, I would never be able to take a shit for the rest of my life. Oh, no, that'd be it. And also, I remember me when you said you don't want to eat 275 of anything. It's a great Mitch Hedberg joke that he goes, I, I love rice. It's really good for when I want to eat a thousand of something. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really funny I can, one. I could eat 275 grains of rice. I, I could definitely do that. Yeah, that's a good point. Perspective, man. That's so, about it. um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, what we've got next, Joe, is is probably the fucking hot dog boys, right? Unless yeah. So weird famous. Testicles are crazy. Kimchi is a little crazy. Peeps are crazy. Mm -hmm. Jalapenos are crazy. But we're on to the the original. Besides bratwurst, we got we got the old dogs, hot dogs, which yeah. are awesome. Uh, it's, and now, because it's been going on for so long, it's almost synonymous with a uh, eating competition. You think of those hot dogs. So. On uh, July 4th, which they still hold the competition every year, 1916 at Coney Island, Nathan's famous hot dogs decided to start having a hot dog eating contest where they would 
do the competition. They'd time the people out, mm-hmm. see how many hot dogs you could get down. And that competition has been going on for so long. I have to imagine it's the longest running in the world. I mean, it's been over a hundred years now. They've been doing it every year, 4th of July to get down there. Of course, every year it gets more and more expensive and more people go. Um, and it has eaters from all around the world. I mean, the aforementioned Black Widow, she's been part of the competition too. Uh, as far as I know, she's never won the hot dog eating competition, but everyone's got their own specialties. And it really is the World Series of eating competitions. I mean, all the best eaters from all around the world who are, whether you make a record eating the most ramen noodles in Japan or the most pork pies in London, you go to the hot dog eating contest because you can win the most money. It's the biggest stage. And uh, for many years, each different type of you know, Americans would win. Even people internationally wouldn't come for a long time back then. But it all culminates in the modern day of eating. In the early 2000s, it started to shift a little bit because a guy comes in named Takiro Kobayashi, and he starts winning every single year. Not just winning every year. He starts breaking his own record of how many hot dogs people have ever eaten in the competition. So I'd have to imagine in the early days, it couldn't have been more than 30 dogs. But Kobayashi shatters the record in the early 2000s by eating 56 hot dogs. And he's skinny as a real time, too. They even showed him lift up his shirt at the end of the competition. And you can see just the, the mass of food in there, how much he had to throw in there. And he continues to crush it for six years straight. From 01 to 06, the Japanese guy comes in and starts winning every single year. And people are getting mad. They're like, this is the 4th of July hot dog eating competition, and we can't win. The Japanese guy comes in. Meanwhile, he gets shredded. He goes from skinny to completely yoked like he is built working out the entire time he's eating hot dogs for a living and he's in the gym the weirdest combination ever but after 2006 he never wins again because the american joey chestnut who is actually the current champion comes in and he he outdoes him i think he outdid him by about 66 dogs the first time and joey chestnut currently holds the record in the year 2021 he's the most hot dogs eaten in competition with a whopping 75 hot dogs. So, I mean, once you, <laughs> once you get to 55, you're like, that's the, that's the record. It's over. You can't do any more. This guy did 75. 75. Yeah. So, and part of the reason why he was able to uh, eat so many is from Kobayashi's method, because in years past, everyone had different ideas. You had to eat the hot dog and the bun, and that was the only rule. It had to be both the hot dog and the bun. So people would sometimes separate the hot dog and eat it first, then eat the bun second. But Kobayashi comes out with a method that's more about speed and efficiency than the usual eating. He breaks the hot dog in half and shoves both sides into each side of his mouth so he can chew it a bit and swallow it. With the cup of water they provide you with, he takes the bun, rips it in half, dip, soaks the bun in water. So it's like soggy, wet bread and just slides it down his throat. And that style of eating hot dogs ever since he did it, watch the competitions next year, Every single person does it now. They break it apart. Goddamn game changer. Yeah, he changed the game. (laughs) And now the guy who holds the world record uses the same method, but he's just better at it than Kobayashi is now. Well, Joey Chestnut. I'll throw a picture of Joey Chestnut and Kobayashi, but one of them looks more like a guy who wins hot dog eating contests, and another guy looks like he should be a ninja warrior. And not just because he's from Japan. The guy's shredded. But, uh, yeah. I was in Washington, D.C. in 2001, and... Um, I was there with my siblings and my mom and my aunts. And I yeah. went to the first is this annual... or post 9-11. Is the Pentagon still not harmed? Uh, this is pre-9-11. Okay, so and they have no idea there's a plane coming for the Pentagon. This is, so. this is, this is uh, between those months of, of, of the summer before 9-11. Um, I went to the There's NSA no question pre 9 11. First time really out of this, out of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine. Yeah. First like Ever. big vacation, you're going on a trip, like an actual. Yep. Oh, sorry. I took a train to Florida one time before that, but that was like a train. So I went to just from like Massachusetts to Florida. Anyway, so, um, so I drew, we, me and my family drove down to Washington, D.C. to my aunt's house. And um, she's an employee of the NSA, National Security Agency who doesn't let anybody in or anybody out for the most part. Um, and they had a family day. The NSA had a fucking family day in 2001. You know it's 9-11 now. <laughs> the family yeah. day. It never happened again, so to speak. No shit. That's hilarious. Yeah. Things I did at the NSA family day. I held all the guns that they had <laughs> as, as a nine-year-old. That's something I did. They had MP5s. 
and assault rifles and they're on a table with like their nsa swat people like splinter cell just you know guys there with no magazines or whatever it is and i held cool. mp5s at, on a fold-out table and i said hey cool this is an nsa this is an mp5 <laughs> it's so funny so i went that this happened dylan reed nine years old mp5 like hey this is fun um <clears throat> um day uh but they also had a uh uh a, a donut eating competition um all right and it was donuts on a string and who could eat the donuts who could who could finish the donut on the string fastest yeah and Jeez. i lost i lost but my brother won so that was probably my first wow food competition was at the nsa at their first and only family day before 9 11 <laughs> where you could hold an mp5 and go in a bouncy house and hold and eat, have a donut eating competition. That's oh. something I have said that I have taken off my bucket list that a lot of people have not. <laughs> Dude, that might that might be the most American thing you've ever done. You were only a kid when you did it. Nine years old, MP5 bouncy house donut comp, donut eating competition <laughs> in the nation's capital <laughs> and in then Washington D.C. At the National Security Agency NSA square building that you have to go through a maze of roadblocks just to even get to the parking lot. Oh my god! Never yeah. forget that day. That's great. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I that didn't know we were going. I was like, "How is this going to wrap into the eating competition?" <clears throat> yep. Yeah. They had a they had the, whoever whoever is the party planner at the NSA decided to throw in a donut competition. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, they're they're currently in the Russian embassy right now. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Oh, yes. What's this? Um, yeah. What's his name? Snowden. Snow. Edward Snowden. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was the party planning committee who had the donuts, gonna... the donut MP5 thing. Yeah. <laughs> that was just a big idea. I thought that it should be a hot dog on a string, but they went with donuts and then I had to flee the country. So, yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yep. So that, that, that ends my, uh, my food competitions. All right, so this is the thing that I don't fucking know, right? Can you tell right. Joe? Can you tell us what Terraria is? We talked about the best competitive eaters in the world, uh, and that's been over the past hundred years. All these competitions they've had, but I have a story about an eater who came before the time of competitive eating competitions, and I believe wholeheartedly would have beaten all these people to a pulp. He is the all-time biggest eater that I ever know about. Enough that he is a piece of history based solely on his gullet. We're going to get into it right now. He's a Frenchman named Terrare. He's got one name, like Madonna or Cher, and his name's Terrare. So this guy is born in France in 1772 to a farmer and his wife. And by his teenage years, he could eat a quarter of an entire cow carcass in a single day. So that means in a week, <laughs> He would have sorry, eaten sorry, it's the, it's the international standard of how much you can eat. Based on a cow carcass, how much could he eat of the cow carcass in one sitting? <laughs> a cow is very expensive. And at, at, a, at a farm, if your son is eating a quarter of a cow carcass every day, you're going to run out of the car. Cow is pretty fast, right? Dude, that's yeah. fucking insane. What do you mean a cow carcass? That's one. How much does one cow weigh? 500 pounds? No, probably about... Uh, 1600 pounds or what you know, the I, uh, fuck so he can eat a quarter of a cow carcass in one fucking day <laughs> okay maybe they're not 1600 but at least a thousand pounds for a all, right, wait, 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 wait. all right so so meat how much all right so this is the way the cow doesn't that's matter because the bones that's and the stomachs and cow, stuff like that they said cow carcass because they don't just mean he had 10 steaks they mean he could eat the the fat the organs the the everything I mean, otherwise it's cow carcass. It's not just a steak. Anyways, so that was in his teenage years. By the time he was 17, he only weighed 100 pounds. And he's eating, uh, he's eating that much every day. He's putting down food. And we already talked about before, the reason why it's so tough to come by eating competitions is because food is scarce, especially in France mm. in the late 1700s. I mean, we're only about 15, 20 years away from the uh, French Revolution. Right now, America's popping off and they need that thing going on. So we're moving on with Terrare, or Terrare, spelled T-A-R-R-E, or A-R-E. Um, so they said that he didn't look normal either, which obviously he didn't if he could accomplish that kind of crazy eating. He had a huge stretched out mouth that it kind of looked like it was like chipmunk cheeks on both sides. 
and he could fit supposedly 12 eggs in his cheeks. So I think in one egg, I could maybe fit two. He could fit 12 apparently. Even if you 12, crack- wait, 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 12 on each side or 12 total? No, 12 total, 12 total eggs. So a whole dozen eggs in his mouth before swallowing. Hey, what about the tongue area too? Like, could you fit them in the in this front part or just the sides? I, I, it's just picture of putting a whole dozen eggs in your mouth and you don't <clears> swallow. Them, whatever. That's All right, I'd be. say I'd say a normal person could probably eat could probably hold four to five tops. I mean, like two on each side. I mean, you have to, you'd have to crack them all first to even try to do that, right? No, no, we're, we're not cracking them, right? I think this is just, this is oh, well, just shell in. Yeah, you gotta uh, hold him with the shell in and everything, just pop them right in there. Yeah. But we're not cracking the eggs. We're doing like whole eggs that can't crack. You're just cramming them in there. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say, dude, I'd say four to six total for a normal person. Like twelve is insane. That's fucked. Big old mouth on the guy, and it fits the rest of them. So he also had a huge flap of stretched out skin where his stomach was because when he would eat, it would get all full up. Like it looked like he was pregnant afterwards because he'd eat so much food. It would, you could literally see his stomach be flabby and drooping. Like he used to be a fat guy and then it would expand out until its proper size. So even as a young man, he had this weird looking body and he could just put wow. down food um, to the point where he becomes famous for it. I mean, so <laughs> the more he's eating, you know, cow carcasses or whatever else he can get his hands on, his parents, <laughs> his parents go, you're eating us out of house and home, literally eating our livelihood. You need to get out. They kick him out of the house. Now he's in his late teens. He's probably 18, 19 years old. Now he's on the street. He didn't have a lot of whole marketable skills. And not only is it not that his skill set is that high, it's the fact that he has a constant addiction to consuming food all day long. It's all he does. He's begging for food. He's stealing food. He's eating out of the trash cans. And he's eating so much around town, he becomes a sideshow act. People start bringing him full buckets of apples. So we're talking about like 20, 24, 50 apples, whatever, bushels coming in. And I just watched <laughs> him just pop them in. People are, are making a crowd. They're forming a crowd and they're bringing him stuff. They're bringing him barrels of corks, of wine corks. He's putting them down. They're bringing him trash cans. And they sit there. Go ahead. Puts it down. He's just eating on the street corner, just putting down anything. It's not even edible. Just throwing it down his gullet, no problem. Just getting it done there. Uh, this happens for a year and a half, two years of him just street performing, just helping people feed him trash. That's what he's doing until he decides he's going to enlist in the army. He's going to make something out of his life. Uh, he didn't want to be a street kid anymore. Mm-hmm. And there was a war that was happening in 1792 between, uh, you know, it's it's all the old European succession stuff. It's Prussia, it's Belgium, it's all that crap. So he, he decides to fight on the side of France, which is where he's from. And he says, I'm going to enlist. So he enlists and immediately people notice he's an insane eating freak right away. This guy is so, so consumed with consumption. Everyone knows it about him immediately. It's not like a secret thing he does. He does it constantly. He's eating out of the trash cans after the mess hall. They end up giving him quadruple portions and he still finishes his plate and then walks into the trash can and starts eating all the discarded food because he's just consuming so much food so all the soldiers are taking notice they go this guy's fucking crazy right anyways he gets to be part of uh you know major operations and he ends up having exhaustion maybe he was injured maybe he was sick they end up sending him to a hospital and getting off of the, the lines of the war and that's where they really figure out who this guy is because now he's in a hospital setting and they're giving him an insane diuretic for intestinal blockage so that he can kind of flush out his- Oh, yeah. Right? You can yep. only imagine what we have in that, in that era, whatever that means in 17. Uh-huh. And the hospital staff is flabbergasted. They're like, this guy is a goddamn machine. They start just feeding him stuff just to see what'll happen. He's like an anomaly. So they, they feed him, uh, what they, they prepare for him is a bunch of different uh, facets of this. So they start making him uh, a, a feast of uh, a meal that they make for 15 people. They, they design a whole dinner table for 15 people. So it's 15 plates of food. Uh, they, they let Terrari go in there, puts it all down easily, takes a nap. So a 15 person meal is put down by one man. <clears> he <throat> takes a nap afterwards. So they it's going, like... It's like the show The Queen's Gambit when she 
plays like 15 other men in chess at the same time yes with, with, yeah, yeah. with eating it's the same thing guys in case everyone's confused yeah but also i I, can't, I don't know if i'm conveying it like just the the apathy he has in doing it he's never like going like hey watch this he just does it's like they just let him go like like what will happen if you do this and then of course he goes yeah he eats the whole thing but he's not really bragging about it it's just he's constantly consumed by this need to eat so he wouldn't be trying to be famous for eating but that's his thing and they keep feeding him they um they give him a raw eel a full raw eel so it's the entire thing dead they hand it to him they say well, how about you eat this he crushes the skull with his teeth so it can fit in his mouth and then he slurps the entire thing down his mouth so i'll put a picture of an eel skeleton up on the page now it's basically a barrel of needles every single rib in the eel is a small needle that will be stabbing all your stomach and intestines he swallowed the whole thing whole no big deal terrare fucking machine dude ate the whole thing i mean at some time in the army they were trying to just feed him the right way and they figured his gift might be used for subterfuge so they decided they're going to give him a box with a note in it he's going to swallow the whole box keep it in his iron stomach he's going to go across enemy lines and deliver the message uh unfortunately in Terrari fashion and in their own fashion, they offered him a bucket of bull organs if he would do it. And he agreed to do it because he wanted to eat a whole bucket of bull organs. That was like his nice fun dessert that he would eat. And he goes over there. Uh, unfortunately, he can't speak German. So they catch him immediately. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what the fuck? Uh, then they, they torture him for a couple hours. They, they whip him in, and then he admits that he has um, precious information in his stomach. They chain into a toilet until he shits it out. Turns out the information wasn't that valuable, so they send him back. And that's where we are now in the hospital. And unfortunately, as it goes on, he, he just starts eating like a complete maniac. He's staying in the hospital trying to get them to, to not only study him for their benefit, but to cure him for his benefit. I mean, this guy is consumed with eating every second of his life. Obviously, he likes eating, but I'm sure he wouldn't want to have to eat this much food every day of his life. I mean, he's eating it's like a constant itch. It's like a constant itch. Yeah. Like it feels good, but it doesn't feel good, you know? He's trying to solve it, right? Yeah. So it starts to get a little bit darker at this point because in the hospital, they're not always feeding him to the degree that he wants. It's more like an experiment. So he's sneaking out and he's going to butcher shops in the back alley and, and opening up their rotting meat trash cans and he's eating the meat out of there. Uh, he starts to go to people who are undergoing bloodletting procedures, which they used to do back in those times where they would cut you and let blood run out because they let all the bad demons out or whatever crazy science they used to think back then. And he would go in there and he would, he would collect the blood that would come out and he'd drink all the blood of the people who were getting bloodletting, just getting anything to get more in there. At one point, he took a live cat and ripped it in half, drank all of its blood, ate every part of the cat besides the bones, and then coughed up a fur ball an hour later. And they're like, we, we, got, a, we got a complete maniac in here, Ferrari. Even at that point, they, they hadn't kicked him out of the hospital yet. He's doing all this insane shit. They're just trying to keep learning more about him. He gets caught trying to eat bodies in the mortuary when he's stuck in the hospital. He's going and finding dead bodies and trying to eat dead people. And they're like, Terrare, dude, you know you eat a lot, but like this is fucking crazy. I mean, it's next level. Even then, they don't kick him out until uh, a little while after that, one of the people in the hospital goes missing happens to be a 14 month old baby and they can't stop the baby. And uh, I think we know where this is going. Terrare got kicked out at that point because they uh, find out that Terrare actually ate the baby. Wow. I mean, this guy is just unbelievable the amount he can put down. <laughs> Fast pretty- forward a few years, he joined the KGB, did some... <laughs> crazy things and his name is actually Val- vladimir putin yeah it is, it is. <laughs> that's that's the, thing. that's the story of him um he's a superhuman uh, psychopath and uh wow um just kidding it's not him he is not him <laughs> so i guess um four years after, i don't know how they didn't put him to death for doing that i imagine they probably couldn't prove that he did it but uh, they all knew like they knew this guy for years they, they knew that that's what happened that's so they, fucked up. Yeah. They sent him on his way. And uh, four years later, he goes back to the same hospital because he's dying from tuberculosis. 
And uh, he dies within a couple of days of it entering the hospital. They're basically just there to, to help him die. And they are like, all right, we got to cut this guy open. What the fuck is going on? Like they never had to really, I mean, back then you couldn't really examine somebody until they died. Like we can now with all our MRIs and CAT scans. They didn't really know yeah. what's going on in there. So he's dead. And they're like, let's get to work on this body. They start opening up his mouth to the point where they can look down into his esophagus and they can see all the way down into his stomach from there. So his stomach cavity isn't like pinched off like ours where the esophagus goes all the way down and then you can't see that deep in. It's mm-hmm. like, it's like a well. You look down and the, the stomach's right there. <laughs> when they cut him open. It's a fucking hole, yeah. Yeah, when they cut him open, his stomach is almost the size of his whole abdominal cavity and all his other organs are, are misformed and very like squished to the side. So he had this massive stomach that's almost the size of his full torso. And because the human stomach is supposed to be designed to be like this large, not even. Yeah, that big, yeah. Yeah, your body not only gets full that way, but it also is able to digest all the nutrients and take them all out. And this guy had a stomach so fucking big, he was never full and he was never digesting the way he should have. So he was never getting any larger. He never was a fat guy. He just had this big giant stomach. He was skinny as hell and he would just fill it up with a, with a you know 15 meals and then barely any of it would go into his system and then he'd shit it all out he well and it sounds oh uh, it's crazy and, and it sounds that he's eating mostly protein and um if you yeah. if you eat a full protein diet you'll lose weight you know if you every for breakfast lunch and dinner only have steak yeah. uh with minimal fats you will inevitably lose weight you could die too if you don't that's how you get scurvy um no, uh, scurvy takes scurvy takes three months of zero vitamin C to get, by the way. Um, but you can, uh, yeah, like uh, literally, you'll, if you eat meat, if you're a high protein diet, you will 100% lose weight. So he could be a normal sized guy, but that's fucking insane. I had no story at all. I never even heard of this in my life. Wine corks and eggshells. He was eating all kinds of shit. Yeah, I think he preferred meat probably because his body was craving the nutrients you can get from a, a, a diet and he just wasn't getting those wow. nutrients so he was constantly wanting i mean the i can understand just trying to fill your belly with all even the disgusting you know meat organs and all that but the, the wanting to drink people's blood and stuff it's like you're it's some kind of insane craving i can't imagine what it was like if yeah I, he's it's it's a a, a full-blown uh addiction to some sort of like chemical like dopamine like it's a it's a mean, it's a dopamine was, problem or something like that. Never not hungry. He said from the from the moment he woke up to the moment he fell asleep, he was never not hungry his whole life. Even when he was full, he would usually when he was full in the way that his stomach was going to explode. That was the only time he could get full, and he usually kind of fall asleep, and then he'd wake up and he'd just be immediately hungry again, and that be it. He just was hungry every day of his life. Sounds fucking horrible. Holy shit! Wow. Yeah, it is a terrible existence. I mean, he had all his teeth were mangled and fucked up. They said that he stunk to high heaven. And this is in sixty in 1792. So you imagine how bad you have to smell in 1792 for people to be like. Just I mean, you got farting smell all bad. the time. You got all smell he did too. was fart. You have to. That has to go somewhere. They said he he rarely ever is there a story of him throwing up. It's only ever it goes through the system or it gets clogged in his intestines and then he nearly dies and they have to give him super high octane, you know, X lax and then save his life. Damn. Wow. I mean, all all the bones and you know, undigestible matter he put in there. It, it really is a wonder he didn't die sooner. And TB got him. Oh yeah. Him. Oh totally. TB got him probably because his lungs were the size of beer bottles instead of you know yeah. milk milk jugs, and he uh, oh, yeah. because they were so squished. Um, oh yeah, his organs must have just been just completely uh, bruised and ruptured, just pushed up against the sides of his uh, you know, rib cage and whatever. I mean, it's wild. Yeah, like a so, naked like a naked on. butt on a fax machine. Exactly. Yes. So, uh, so we'll, we'll wrap it up. We'll wrap it up with our boy. What's his name again? Our, our, our man. Uh, yeah, that's Terare, the man with one name and a stomach that's bigger than anyone I've ever seen. Um, so that's it for for this episode, guys. This is a crazy time. Um, we're so excited that we were able to produce this one. Um, yeah. and we'll see you guys next week. And uh, be sure to check our Instagram. Be sure to, you can even email us or comment. And even more specifically, if you guys have got things you want to see on the pod, write us, write us. We'll probably talk about it. Um, we got, we got between Joe and I, 
right, Joe? We got 10,000 ideas about things to talk about, but we want to hear from you guys as well. So let us know. And um, Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, we usually talk about like more in-depth topics, but this was just a fun one to go into this week. And now we're going to get into more, you know, dicey stuff and more interesting stuff and just more fun stuff like this. So yeah, just let us know. Yeah, spice it up, see what happens. Um, and again, throw it on in the car. You don't need to watch it um, or throw it on the big old TV you got and watch us do what you will. Talk. Yeah, get it going. We got some good visuals and uh, we'll see you guys next week and we'll have this one out for you soon. So um, have a good one. That's the Dylan and Joe Basement Podcast where uh, Dylan and Joe and Joe. <laughs> That's new. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> fuck it, man. Why not? I mean, we might as well play it up, you know, get it moving. So. So it's we're at one. Um, people, people. All right, all right, hang on, hang on. Before that, um, common scene around went up later on. But anyways, alcohol was used for pleasure. But we love this. We love this apps <laughs> because so they are good to us. When you bring in a coupon for things to eat or oil changes for pony <laughs> rides or for these subs <laughs> because <laughs> they are good. Because I any show- co- any coupon works. Yes. <laughs> I want to show those yeah, yeah. Show those guys. Because for those of you who aren't old, like a lot of people don't know what's good right now, man. And that was those commercial. The fact that we both remember that and it was on for like six months tops is fucking insane. And that came out in what, 2001, 2002? And Quiznos doesn't suck. They're out of business now. They're gone. Alcohol was used for pleasure and for an what's called analgesic. Right, but they say it analgesic. I've never heard the word before. Analgesic. All right, well, if you go to the poison ivy section in Walgreens, you'll see it a lot. Um, uh, <clears throat> well, poison ivy is a bad example. What, but what is pain, right? You know, um, <laughs> it's <laughs> right, stay on target. <laughs> no, 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 no. Analgesic <laughs> is, is, is a pain reliever. That's the definition of analgesic. Someone like house a uh, cheeseburger in two minutes. I'm like, I couldn't even do that. Like, I just, I, I don't have the, the, Intestinal fortitude. I can't believe that. That's a good word, yeah. <laughs> Intestinal fortitude. You know, you've got like apple bobbing and hot dog strings. I oh, started. <laughs> <laughs> Wait,